Okay, go ahead and report it. All right, let's bring this meeting to order. My name is Michael Fager. I'm the chair of the Community Preservation Committee. I'm also the uh, representative of the Conservation Commission on this meeting. Uh, tonight is a public hearing uh, on how we should spend CPA funds next year. I'm going to let the members of the committee introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Dick Bauer and I represent the Historic Preservation Commission. Hi, I'm, I'm Jessica Palacios Yamakawa. I represent the gen general public. Uma Murugan, a general public member and vice chair. I'm Luisa Oliveira, and I'm a parks planner in the city department of open, Sp wait a second, office of strategic planning and community development. <laughs> I'm Liz Duclo Orsello, I'm a general public member. Uh, Mike Capuano, I am the representative from the planning board. Okay, briefly, tonight's meeting is going to, um, as I said, it is a hearing to see how we are going to spend our funds for next year. Um, we are going to take testimony. Well, first off, Kristen will give us um, an overview of the CPC plan and the purpose. Then we have invited testimony from a variety of people. Um, they will be limited to five minutes. Um, she will be our timekeeper. She has signs. When she holds up her signs, please pay attention. Um, and then when we are done with the formal testimony, we'll be opening it up for an, um, testimony from the public. Again, no more than five minutes per person. So, Kristen. So hello, my name is Kristen Stelges. I'm the Community Preservation Act Manager. Um, and if you need to get in touch with me, my email will be on these slides, but also my cards are in the back. And I'm just gonna give an overview of CPA so we're all on the same page and let you know a little bit about how funds have been spent to date and what the current priorities are for the Community Preservation Committee. So the Community Preservation Act is a state law. Um, 172 municipalities across Massachusetts have adopted it, and it lets us collect a surcharge on property tax that can go towards funding four things, affordable housing, historic preservation, and open space and recreational land. Um, in addition to the surcharge, we can give an optional city appropriation each year to add to the funds, and then we get a state match. So, so far, we've gotten over $2 million in the state match um, to help us um, fund even more projects than we could otherwise. The enabling legislation tells us what we can and cannot fund with these monies. Um, and so you see this box here. If it doesn't fit in a box, unfortunately, CPA is not the right fit, but it does allow us to fund a wide range of projects. So um, we can acquire properties for affordable housing and new open space, historic resources, and we can preserve and rehabilitate them. With the exception of affordable housing, we can only kind of fix up stuff that has been created with CPA money. So CPA has only been in Somerville for five years, so hopefully none of those units already need to be fixed up that have been created. Um, but we have been able to do quite a lot of good stuff with the money so far. Tonight, one of the main things that the committee is seeking input on is how to allocate the funds across these areas. The enabling legislation says you at least have to give a minimum of 10% for each of these categories. So far, since fiscal year 15, which was the first year project funds were allocated, the committee has given a minimum of 55, sorry, 45% to affordable housing and 15% each to historic and open space recreational land, which is counted as one category. 5% goes for the administration. That's a maximum set by the enabling legislation. That pays for things like my salary and for um, supplies like the public participation slide, supplies you see in the back so that we can um, manage our program. So that doesn't add up to 100. Maybe you've Cut on to that. The extra 20% is flexible and that goes to meet um, the demand as it changes because 
we've seen a kind of pretty widely varying applications each year in historic and open space. And so that is allocated across the three categories based on the demand of the projects each year. So in addition to this meeting where we seek input and the written comment process, we also do this voting activity, which you can do tonight. And so this is to just share with you, from the summer streets, we ask people to vote with 10 pom-poms how they would allocate the funding. And you have to follow the same rule, which you have to tonight. You have to give one of your pom-poms each to housing, historic, and open space and recreational land, because that's what the committee has to do. And so you can see here that um, the amount that people have wanted to go towards affordable housing has gone up from 2016 to 2017 from 36% to 42%. Um, historic has been 22, 18%, pretty um, consistent over the years, and open space recreation at 36, 33%. Um, and so that's, you know, people on, on the street, and I'm sure we'll hear from you what you guys think tonight. Um, and in case, you're now wondering, well, what has that actually meant in terms of projects so far? We're estimating next year, and this is a low estimate because we don't have a perfect sense of what our budget is going to be for next year at this point in the year, but we think there'll be about $1.8 million available for new projects. If we just did the 10% minimums in Somerville, that would mean that there'd be a minimum of $182,000 for each category, and then the remainder would be flexible. But if you look at how the funds have been allocated to date in terms of actual awards that have been made, 48% of the funding has gone to affordable housing, 29% to open space and recreational land, and 23% to historic resources. Um, there have been two bonds, a $2.5 million bond for West Branch Library, and a $6 million bond was just approved for the 100 Homes Affordable Housing Project, but the debt service on those have not yet started. The, we anticipate they'll start next year, so that's partly why we don't include those. Um, but you can see here on this slide what the funding looks like with the um, bonding included. So, um, and maybe, um, depending if the Board of Aldermen adopts the Finance Committee's report from last night, these numbers will go up because um, they're considering the FY18 historic and uh, open space request, or recommendations from the CPC this year. But we've funded um, with CPA funds in Somerville 42 projects without bonding $11 million worth of projects and $20 million if you include the two bonds. Um, and this is to just show the variability and awards year to year. And this is a pretty good sense of how... Um, of the number of applications that come in, because until this year, the committee has been able to fund all of the historic and open space projects that were kind of ready to be funded that they thought were worth funding, and I think the Housing Trust has been in a pretty similar place. So you can see that, um, so this is without bonding, that the historic projects, we had a lot at the beginning, and that's um, gone down in terms of requests, and not as much with open space and how that's gone up over time. Um, and then with housing, this has really followed the funding that has been available from year to year. Um, you can see that with bonding, because of the uh, 100 homes bond, that um, jumps up towards the end there. Um, oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. So if you are curious about how these decisions are made, their um, recommendations are made by this body that's before you tonight, um, and they described who they are. Um, unfortunately, um, we are losing one of our general public members this year. She's coming to the end of her term limit. So if you would like to join the Community Preservation Committee, we'll be recruiting for a new member this fall. Um, they manage an annual application process. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, also has an annual process that they manage for the affordable housing um, request. This committee sees the request for a historic and open space, as I said. And those decisions are guided by the annual community preservation plan, which we're all here to talk about tonight. So I don't want to um, go into the, you know, describe in great detail what the current priorities are, but to say um, we hope that you'll vote on these tonight. So I'm going to talk, in addition to doing the pom-pom voting about the percent allocation, 
we want to get your input on what the priorities should be and how they rank for you. So everyone has a little strip of five blue dots. Um, after the testimony or before you leave, put them on the priority that resonates most with you. Um, we have priorities generally and then in the uh, specific categories. So generally the CPC seeks to fund projects that are consistent with the community's values, looking at issues of accessibility, sustainability, that have broad support, um, are consistent with the planning goals of the city, are blended and support diversity, including support to immigrants, regardless of status, and that use CPA funding strategically um, in these ways. And then an open space, really wanting to see the creation of new open space through acquisition, expanding access to our rivers and ensuring their health, um, rehabilitating according to need and expanding urban agriculture and community housing, looking at affordability and perpetuity, expiring units, supporting mixed use and transit oriented development and preventing homelessness. Um, the priorities for the historic resources project are being, or, sorry, category are being developed through the creation of a historic preservation plan. In the interim, the CPC is prioritizing projects that fulfill a need and that are great at, at greatest risk of being lost. Um, so if you have not already and you would like to give comments, um, there's a place to sign up on the table in the back. Please do so, and if you leave here and you say, I wish I would have said something else, please. Um, until May 18th, we're accepting written comments, so please reach out to me. And then we can move on to the invited testimony. Okay, um, so we are here as a hearing tonight. Um, we have invited certain people to give us testimony before we hear from the general public. Our first person to testify tonight is Melissa Woods, who is a senior planner. Is she here? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Melissa Woods, and I'm a senior planner in the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development, and I work closely with Louisa, um, but I'm in the long range planning office, so you might have seen me um, at neighborhood planning events. Um, my office and myself and my peer, Dan Bartman, uh, work on neighborhood plans. Uh, so far, we've completed about four of them since the adoption of Summer Vision, Union Square, Winter Hill, um, Gilman Square, and Lowell Street Station area. So hi to the familiar faces in the room. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't bring enough copies for everyone here, but what the CPC is looking at is uh, a document that's available online at summervillema.gov slash summervision. And it's a six month update that we report to the board on our progress based on the summer vision numbers. So the summer vision numbers, um, let me rewind real quick. Has everybody in the room heard of summer vision? That's the city's adopted comprehensive plan. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that as everyone's heard of Summer Vision, not no one. So uh, there's some numbers that uh, we set as targets uh, for, our, um, for our community to achieve by the year 2030, and that's uh, 30,000 new jobs, 6,000 new units of housing, of which uh, 1,200 are affordable, uh, 125 new acres of open space, and lastly, that 50% of new trips are by sustainable modes of transportation. And uh, what's on the spreadsheet is that we're doing pretty well, um, but some of the numbers are tracking better than others. Um, for instance, our housing and our jobs goal, we primarily lie on private development to achieve these goals um, through our neighborhood planning process and uh, deciding where uh, jobs and housing should be. Um, we then turn um, to the private, the private development to community to achieve those goals. Uh, the numbers reported here um, are based on certificate of occupancy, so things like the four or five hundred unit development in assembly square that's in construction right now is not yet on this spreadsheet. So uh, we're doing pretty well for our jobs and our housing goals. Um, but the one thing that we are falling short on is our open space creation. 
So far, we've created 17 uh, new usable acres of open space, um, and that's only 13% of our goal. Um, we would hope to be on track with um, the other jobs and housing numbers are around 20 to 25%. Um, so at least we'd want to be tracking evenly with those. And so I'm here this evening um, because I would like to advocate um, for more open space creation from the CPC. Um, but I would like to put some caveats on that because not all open space is created equally. Um, but I first want to give a brief overview of the zoning overhaul. Um, last year, I think I said the same thing, um, that we're pursuing a zoning overhaul for the entirety of Somerville. And that puts a 17.5% open space requirement in our transformational areas, which are Assembly Square, Boynton Yards, uh, parts of Union Square. Um, and that 17.5% requirement will help us fulfill our summer vision goal. Um, but in addition, when the CPC is um, debating requests um, and applications, um, like I said, not all open space is created equal. So it's good to consider um, open space acquisition that could create, um, increase our existing open space number is adjacent to or, um, or our schoolyards. Um, acquisition that uh, fulfills goals that are identified in the open space and recreation plan or in other neighborhood plans. Um, and then lastly, acquisition in our conserve and enhance areas of the summer vision map because we are able to uh, partner with developers to get the open space requirement we need in transformational areas um, in completely you know, new neighborhoods, but it's harder to do that in our existing neighborhoods that are uh, built out. So um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and I look forward to seeing your work in the future. It's already been so good so far, right? We need both. I think parks, our parks are well loved and used. So when a park does need to be renovated, um, I think it's important that you uh, consider those as well. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, it actually. Um, actually, um, using that 17 and a half percent as a baseline, um, that does get us to to our goal. Um, but that is assuming we, development, um, which will likely uh, take longer than 2030 um, to achieve. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woods. Um, second, we have a uh, Somerville Capital Planning update from Emily Monea. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Monet. I am the director of Somerset for the city of Somerville, and I'm also the former CPA manager, so I'm glad to be back. Um, so I'm here to give an update on Somerville's capital planning and how that relates with the CPA. So um, we, the city has converted to, instead of producing a CIP, a published CIP that is out of date almost the minute it's published, we now keep alive um, capital investment plan project list. And that's available online. The most recent version that's published is current as of October 2017. And it covers a 10-year period from FY18 to FY27. <coughs> um, we categorize every project that's on the list. Uh, 
At the top are the critical projects. These are the projects that are required to fulfill summer vision and the Union Square neighborhood plan. This is primarily driven by infrastructure investments. Um, also a new public safety building um, and associated issues that are needed to, to fulfill the Union Square neighborhood plan and by extension summer vision. We also have recurring investments. So every year the city invests in streets. We invest in more water and sewer infrastructure. We invest in building upgrades. Um, we have legacy infrastructure needs in the city, as I'm sure you're all aware, as pretty much every New England town has. And so one of the ways that we're tackling these infrastructure needs is by every year chipping away at them a little bit with these recurring investments. Underway projects, pretty straightforward. These are the ones that are ongoing but not yet completed. West Branch Library is a great example of this. Um, which the CPA so generally funded a portion of. Pending, this is kind of a strange category, but these are ones that are, um, we're recommending they, all of, none of these, well, some of them have been funded by the Board of Aldermen. Um, they all will eventually, or hopefully, will be funded by the Board of Aldermen. The pending ones are ones that the administration is proposing to elevate, so to speak as compared to our unscheduled projects, which are, we know that these are needs, they're identified by the community, we know that we know their priorities, but we don't yet have a timeline or a funding source identified for them yet. So these top four, categ these top four categories and the projects that fall in them are what we call scheduled projects. These have an identified funding source and they have a specific timeline. So these are the ones that the administration, with the support, hopefully with the support of the Board of Aldermen, hopes to undertake in the next 10 years. It's not to say that the unscheduled ones we won't do, but these are just the ones that we've specifically identified a timeline and a funding source for. So what are the funding sources? There's obviously the general fund. Um, the debt service for these projects could be paid out of the general fund. For our water and sewer infrastructure, the debt service will be paid out of the water and sewer enterprise funds. Of course, there are grant sources like CPA. And MassWorks, we received a $13 million MassWorks grant to fund infrastructure work in Union Square. And then there's the debt exclusion for the Somerville High School. So if you just look at the general fund and you just look at scheduled projects, in the 10-year period, we're proposing to fund $213 million worth of projects through the general fund. So that means $213 million um, transformed into debt service payments will come out of the general fund. So that's um, mostly made up by the critical projects. A big chunk of that is a proposed new public safety building, since the existing one in Union Square has to be relocated and doesn't currently meet our needs. There's the reincurring investments that I talked about, which, while relatively small on an annual base, add up to a lot over a 10-year period. And again, those are chipping it away at our legacy infrastructure needs. The underway, that's quite high because that includes the $50 million payment that we're making towards the Green Line extension, which is obviously expensive, but money well spent for our community. So <clears throat> the city has a policy to keep general fund debt service payments below 7% of general fund expenditures. And excuse my error, this should say expenditures here. So over the 10-year horizon, if we were to undertake that $213 million worth of project costs, and trans transfer that into debt service payments, we do reach that 7% benchmark in about FY26. Now this is a projection, a lot will and can change here. Um, you know, the projects could change. Um, the, you know, if our, if we get more grants, you know, our, the team, especially in OSBCD, is avid about applying for grants like MassWorks, which can have a dramatic impact on the numbers here. But as you can see, these um, scheduled projects are, are um, currently projected to, sh to eat up most of the city's bandwidth for debt service over the next 10 years. So that means for our unscheduled projects, which um, has, have been referred to as unscheduled but not unloved, these are important projects. A lot of them are, um, could be open space projects. Um, it's not that we're not gonna do them, we just have to be creative in identifying funding sources for them. And the CPA is one of those. So um, I'll leave it there, but I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. I'm pretty sure the answer is none. Okay. Yeah. So this is primarily streetscape projects, building projects, maybe some of the historic aspects of our any building projects, um, but it's a small portion. It's a small okay. portion. So the majority of it is the unscheduled 
That's right. That's right. It's really hard to estimate what the unscheduled projects cost because they're unscheduled. We don't have, we only have really rough cost estimates for them. And I, I wouldn't want to quote a number here. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That does not. <laughs> Any more questions? Questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. Next, we have Danny LeBlanc from the Somerville Community Corporation. Just for the recording, okay, great. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to testify about the critical need for affordable housing in Somerville. I'm often asked these days, what do you mean by affordable housing? So I'll offer up these three key ingredients that make for housing that we should count as affordable. One, the affordability requirement is reflected in a deed restriction and any other legal documents that pertain to the property. Two, that affordability restriction is for at least 20 years and preferably in perpetuity. And three, that the housing in question is designated for a specific income band of the community that we can agree is otherwise unable to attain housing in the community that they can afford. While there's much talk in Somerville about longtime homeowners renting affordably to their tenants, in fact, my wife and I do that with our three family, I wanna clarify that such situations do not constitute affordable housing because while such housing might be affordable today, it can literally be unaffordable tomorrow due to a sale or another decision made by the owner. Another fact about affordable housing, which sounds almost too simple to state, but I find is often not understood, there is simply no affordable housing that does not involve public subsidy to make that housing affordable. At least not by the definition I'm offering, which constitutes affordable housing that our community can count on for many years going forward. How much money does it take to make housing affordable? There are really three factors at work in determining that question, the cost of acquiring the land, the cost to acquire and rehab an existing building or to build a new building, and the income level of the households that the affordable housing is intended to serve. In Somerville, we find that depending on the combination of those factors, it takes anywhere from $100,000 to $300,000 to make a unit of housing permanently affordable. And sadly, I need to say that the subsidy need is likely to only go up in Somerville as all the cost factors continue to increase. Finally, how much affordable housing do we need? I don't have a perfect answer to that question, but I would suggest that it is substantially more than the 9.7% of our housing stock that we have today. By comparison, Boston has 19% of its housing stock restricted affordable, and Cambridge, uh, nobody's idea of a bastion of affordability and diversity sits at 14.8%. The Somerville answer lies in asking ourselves what kind of community we want to be. Our answer can be found to a significant degree in looking at the income levels of current Somerville residents and what housing costs folks can afford without overburdening their incomes. Do we want to continue to be the diverse, vibrant community we have treasured, or do we want to increasingly become a community of only well-to-do and a fairly small number of low and modest income folks? How might we get from our current 9.7% affordable housing stock to something more in the 15 to 20% range? To some degree, the answer is in simple math. So in round numbers, Prior to the current building boom in Somerville, we had about 34,000 housing units and 3,400 of them affordable. 
round numbers. In the wildest imaginations of some of us, let's say we'll add 10,000 new units over the next 20 years. That would give us 44,000 housing units. To get to 15% affordability, we'd need 6,600 of those units. And to get to 20%, it would be an 8,800. Even with our current inclusionary zoning requirement of 20% on new development, we'd need to find a way to secure affordability on another 1,200 to 3,400 units of housing. I present these numbers not to overwhelm ourselves with the enormity of the challenge, though it is a huge one, but to help us all get quite real about the task at hand, <laughs> what it will take, and what it will cost to get where we want to be as a community. There need to be many sources of money and political will to achieve these affordable housing goals, but CPA and the Community Preservation Committee are among them. Through the 100 Homes Program, for example, CPA funds have already secured 45 units of permanently affordable housing by buying properties up for sale and taking them off the speculative market. That costs $6.9 million in, C in CPA dollars to do. I was asked to comment on the current allocation of CPA dollars, as other people here are asked to do, um, as well as on the housing priorities, so really briefly, while I hope that the affordable housing challenge and numbers I've presented could be seen to justify the maximum possible expense for housing, I work at SCC and as participants and leaders of the campaign to pass CPA in Somerville in the first place, we've always believed that a more balanced distribution is warranted and so support the percentages that the CPC has utilized during its years of operation to date, the 45, 15, 15 that we saw before. Um, regarding the priorities for community housing, I suggest one change and one addition. The change is from preserving expiring use units to preserve all current affordable housing units. And the example I'll cite is the current effort to redevelop Clarendon. Many of us believe without that effort, we will lose that housing stock eventually. That's not expiring use housing, but it is critically needed affordable housing. And the one uh, addition I would make, which kind of speaks to the effort of the 100 Homes Program, is to move um, units off the private speculative market into restricted affordable housing stock. And the reason is simply in a city that's already as densely built as we are with about 34, 35,000 housing units before the current period, you can't get to the level of affordabilities that I'm suggesting without penetrating the existing housing stock. Thank you. units um, as, as it relates to uh, I don't know, persons more affordably housed, right? I mean, the unit, the, the, I, I guess, you know, we're talking about units, but yeah. are, are, when you use the word unit here, are you using that to refer to, any, you know, a, a one bedroom unit is counts the same in your, in your accounting here as a yeah, five, uh, four bedroom unit, just uh, trying to get a handle on that. I, the answer is yes. I, what I can tell you is that there are no um, less than one bedroom units. So, for, for example, no single room occupancy units or studios. Um, and I could get you a hard count on the numbers of units with each category of bedroom size. I don't have them with me. Yeah, okay. I think what I was just trying to get at for my own numbers in my head is in terms of population growth, I mean, Somerville, I started to point, also has a X number of people who live here. Right. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, it, it, the rough math today would say that there's, you know, something like 2.2 per unit of 2.2 people per unit on average. So you can do the math from there. Okay. Mr. LeBlanc, over the last few weeks, I have been involved in getting the Board of Aldermen to approve the six million dollar bond that we authorized for the 100 Homes Project this past year. Uh, during the course of this, there has been some pushback, not that no one does not af support affordable housing, but they think that maybe we should be spending more money on open space. As you know, there is a huge demand in this city for more playing fields. Um, and they are looking to us to perhaps increase our allocations of open space money uh, 
although no one has actually said this, but the implication is perhaps less to affordable housing and more to open space to address that concern. <coughs> How would a reduction in the percentage of CPC funds that we authorize per year affect your programs if we decided to give more to open space for fields and such? Um, you know, I guess the, the easiest way I can answer that is to simply say we, and, and we're, not the only, we're not the only entity that does affordable housing, so the Summerville Housing Authority, for example. Collectively, we would simply be able to do fewer projects and fewer units of housing. I think that's the simplest way uh, to, to answer that. And I, it, it, I appreciate the challenge that you face, and as a community, you, you know, you can tell by num my numbers, you could put all the money into affordable housing and you still, we'd still have a huge uphill climb. So I appreciate choices you've got to make. I, I think I'm offering support for, to continue the 45, 15, 15, and you might look to spend more of the 20. On, on a priority like open space, if there's a felt need and some really good projects coming there or historic. But I appreciate the, the, the challenge that you have to, I think the answer would be, there would simply be fewer units in aggregate being done, whether it's by new construction or through the 100 homes program, because it, it really does come down to dollars and cents per unit. So, so um, the 1,200 units that the Summer Vision Progress Report is uh, reporting against is showing quite a bit of progress towards the 1,200, but are you saying that the 1,200 isn't going to even get us up to where Cambridge is, for example? Is that what you're saying here? Yes. Simply, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and I can... Um, I can provide more backup for that to the extent that you all want to understand it. Part of what I rely on is the, uh, what's called the state subsidized housing inventory where the state counts community by community. Um, affordable housing units that actually meet the definition that's put out for restrictions and so forth. And yes, yeah, sadly, and I, you know, we could talk a long time about why I think that is. Personally, I think it owes to the fact that Somerville was historically a very inexpensive place to live. It was also a very densely built out place, and therefore, we didn't create as much dedicated affordable housing. We didn't have the land, and we didn't have the need for a long time. It's caught up with us rapidly now. One more question. Thank you, Mr. Boy. Next, we have um, Mary Cassio from the Affordable Housing Trust. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yes, Mary Cassio, lifelong resident of Somerville. I grew up in um, the Nunnery Grounds, East Somerville, which East Somerville re remains the most affordable section of Somerville, but. Um, each day I listen to stories um, from patients, because I work at Cambridge Health Alliance, from Uber driver, taxi drivers, or anyone I encounter about how they lived in Somerville, but they can't afford to anymore. And I was one of those kids growing up that um, we were very poor, um, and my mother was a single parent. And so my grandmother owned a three-family home, and that's the only reason we were able to even afford to be in Somerville. So for 30 years, well, 29, next year will be the 30th anniversary of, of the creation of the Affordable um, Housing Trust Fund. I have served um, on the um, trust fund. It's been my pleasure. And like Danny, um, I, um, I have a two family that I got from my daughter and I keep that unit so unbelievably affordable as my mother does, who wasn't able to afford to buy a house until she was in her 60s and I had to co-sign for her. So I tell you these heartfelt stories about knowing what it's like to deal with affordability. But also, when we do some analysis and study of um, our patients, who most frequently visit emergency departments. Eight of the 10 most frequent visitors in Cambridge at the hospital, but also here in Somerville, are people who are homeless. Um, the 
housing is the most important um, social determinant of health. And while it feels good, and I also talk to people about um, what's more important, at what point will be, it will be enough, being under 10% is um, um, modest. Um, Cambridge is a much more affluent city, so we can afford to do the 80% maybe from its um, allocation from CPA funds, um, but it has resulted in a higher percentage. We really are losing the diversity that we all value in our city, and so it's of huge concern, um, and, and hence my being here to advocate. I appreciate the community service that you do. I appreciate that you've made the funds available to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. But I'll tell one more story, because I think people relate to stories more than just numbers. And Danny did a great job. And yes, the innovation we did with the 100 homes is tremendous. It gave us the biggest boost of affordable housing. But we don't have the funds to do the next 45. Um, but um, my neighbor's house went on the market and was on the market for less than one week with 19 bids that went a half million do dollars over the asking price. That is what we are facing every day and that's why Somerville is changing so drastically. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, we, we're all very much aware of the 100 Homes Project and we've spent a lot of time and money on that project. Can you give us a one minute encapsulation of what you do that's not a 100 Homes Project? Yes. Uh, some of my notes. In fact, one of our pro projects was a twofer um, because the units at the, um, that we did with the Somerville Housing Authority um, um, the Mystic Waterworks uh, was 25 units that we put resources into. Um, so it was both historic and it was affordable housing. Um, let me look at it, we have a little chart here. Um, a Glen Street, um, eight units we did. Um, this is CPA money I'm focusing on. Um, uh, I mentioned the Mystic Waterworks. Uh, uh, besides units themselves, we do rental assistance um, pro programs, preventing people from becoming homeless, um, uh, which is such an important piece too for um, uh, preventing growing the problem. We've done a project with Short Stop, um, which is for young people in the city of Somerville, resulting in um, nine units. Um, I'm looking at my colleagues that I may have forgotten, but if it gives you a flavor, um, early on we did work with Respond, we did work with, I believe, the Somerville Home. So, um, and it's interesting because the CPA has enabled us to do so much more. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned it will be our 30th anniversary next year, and I think the CPA resources um, have nearly doubled what we've been able to do, but the need as documented continues. Sorry for the long answer. I have another question. If we did add a priority, an additional priority, to move units off the private speculative market, what does that mean and how, what are the mechanisms that you might think of to use to do that? I, yeah. That's right. Um, I actually think the 100 homes has been the most innovative way for us to actually acquire. And I do think we've used an informal network um, um, of people committed to the community that we have in Somerville, the diversity in Somerville now, that it's not all about a profit, which is hard to um, ask people to forego, but if you care about the whole community and not just yourself, I think sometimes there are those trade-offs. So I think 100 Homes has been wildly successful 
I can't think of a substitute that could have the kind of effectiveness um, at, at, at this pace, but I, there are other housing people here that, that might offer something. It is an. Uh, sure. Yes. Um, those amounts are very small, very small, um, and it's it's. Um, as someone from the city said it so nicely that it's it's hard to say because both are so necessary, but I think all of us would say that if we can prevent adding to the problem, because usually if someone's getting evicted from their unit it's likely you're going to spend more money on their next unit. Um, but you don't see it as necessarily being a trade-off would really just be sense. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that you feel like you could do... It's such a modest amount that it wouldn't even enable us to get another um, okay. um, uh, one house Sorry. for the 100 homes with everything we do on the prevention side. All right, thank you. Um, now we're going to switch a little bit and we'll go to Mary. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, Barbara Magnum. I'm sorry, I'm losing my place in my own notes. <laughs> and you're going to talk about historic. Uh, okay. All right, so I've got five minutes. It's a very difficult sell to talk about historic preservation within the context I've been hearing. <clears throat> How can you say historic preservation you know, should get more money when you've got people who are homeless, right? Uh, in my own family, I have a sister who's possibly homeless, getting there, and uh, another one who lives with my mother. And so I understand this very much, but I am also here to say man cannot live by bread alone and that you have to have inspiration, you have to have your roots and everything else. And so I put together this little five minutes PowerPoint that I hope will just be kind of fun for you all and help you understand my great passion about preserving things, okay? So we'll go through it rather quickly. I know, this is self-explanatory. We have a very rich history here in Somerville. However, I would also like to say that history or stories of people everywhere, everybody's got a rich history. So, but we have a very nice one, if we preserve it. So this is a very sad situation, Danny, that, <laughs> that I hope may come forward for historic preservation funds. Everyone knows that Somerville was kind of agricultural there for a little bit, and then, you know, from 1870 to 1930, it went from 15,000 to 104,000 people. Most of the housing stock is from that time. And uh, I think in terms of affordability, even an average homeowner has difficulty with the uh, costs of maintaining a house in Somerville. So, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. This is Ed Gordon, he's a historian who we have lead a lot of uh, tours around the city. This is his favorite house. It really depends on, you know, your point of view. Here's a house I wish we still had, the Timothy Tufts house. It was on Elm Street, it was from the 1700s. It was demolished after 1904, and it was, must have been considerably after because Evelyn Battinelli remembers her mother crying when this came down. <laughs> However, here we have one that is preserved. 
hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. So we have lots of proverbs here for, <laughs> for now. And uh, you can see this is St. Joseph's steeple before it was hit by lightning and burned. That's what happens to most of these steeples. Now the ones that you see are often of metal. They're not of uh, wood. And here it is. Fire takes a huge number of uh, historic preservation, uh, well, properties. So it's something to consider. Hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. I think that could be the mantra at some real museum. <laughs> And also hoping for the best is accessibility, which we've gotten funds from the CPA for. Once upon a time, having that enjoyable time, looking back, no place like home. Crying over spilt milk. Yeah, this is the barrel house. We have the bullfinch staircase from it at the museum. What's done is done, the Civil War. Or is it? I just bring this up because these are maps of the United States showing all the Confederate statues and other statues that are being taken down all over the country. <laughs> the old library. Some, this is the view from uh, Bunker Hill looking into the Mystic River and Somerville's on the left and Medford's on the right. I think of the tombstones as little breadcrumbs of history. <laughs> and we can't forget, here's the memorial, Soldier and Sailors Monument of the Civil War, dedicated in 1909, or can we? And I want to mention, here we have it, not looking in the best of shape. Here we have one, and I don't know if you can see, but it says, we can't forget. But for everything in my mind, it looks completely forgotten. And here is the playground, which is very strangely mixed in with this entire thing. A very interesting idea. George Santayana, I love this. This is for World War I, just for you buffs. Van Gogh, looking at the Marne. The Marne 100 years ago. The Marne today. The monument device and a window. Here is the plaque that is on our greatest monument in all of Somerville. And it's in terrible shape. The plaque is, the piece itself is actually not too bad. One of the other homes. And I am gonna take enough time for everyone to read this. It's my very favorite. I, you probably, if I've given any other kind of presentation, you've seen it before, but it's this quote about preservation, and this is also Eileen Schofield, the president of Historic Somerville, who uh, could not be here tonight. And that is the end. Thank you very much. Does anyone have questions? Thank you. Um, next we have Sarah White. Um, yes, yeah, so Sarah White is one of the city's preservation planner. Um, she wasn't able to be here this evening, but she did share with me the three priorities um, for the planning office this year related to preservation. So you'll know what they are up, what they're up to. The first is submitting the preliminary study report for a Union Square local historic district to the state, um, which would be the Massachusetts Historical Commission working with the aldermen on the updated demolition review ordinance and getting the local historic district homeowners fund up and running that was funded by the community preservation commission committee and that includes the applications media official announcements and communications and messaging i don't know if you i don't can't answer many questions but if you have any questions <laughs> All right, next, shifting to open space, we have uh, Renee Scott from Green and Open Somerville. I'm Renee Scott. Thank you for inviting me to speak on behalf of Green and Open Somerville and what we would like to see the committee focus on for open space. 
We want the percentage of open space the CPA funds, that the CPC funds to be, I'm sorry, <laughs> my printer was not working, so I'm having to read between the lines here, um, that the CPA funds to be higher. We'd like to see even distribution of funds between the three categories of, of affordable housing, historic preservation, and open space and outdoor recreation. Especially considering that the proposed transfer fee would go towards affordable housing, open space needs more attention. As we increase density, the proportion of open space per person needs to be, at a minimum, remaining the same. The current CPC priorities of land acquisition, corridor building along the Mystic and Alewife Brook, shoreline and wetland health, and urban agriculture are the most important from our point of view. We'd prefer to see CPA funds going towards new green space rather than redoing existing, since acquiring new space is by far our biggest hurdle. No one would deny that Somerville needs more open space. Summer Vision sets the goal for 125 additional acres. 77% of Somerville is covered in impervious surfaces. Green space answers many of the problems we face from climate change. It reduces the heat island effect and its associated health problems, reduces the flooding due to higher tides and increased precipitation, lowers carbon emissions, and, if done properly, can increase habitat for pollinators. Green space also addresses many of the issues we face as city dwellers. It helps to clean the air, provides a place to experience nature, and offers a healthy place to recreate. The three areas we would like to see the CPC prioritize are as follows. First, more natural space that offers both a place for Somerville residents to experience nature and also helps to mitigate rising sea levels and reduce flooding, cool our urban environment, and increase air quality. Climate change will cause more severe storms that will bring more precipitation and rising tides, which in turn will increase flooding. We need to address this with areas like the Elwife Wetland in Cambridge that both takes in the additional water without detriment detrimental effects, but also provides a natural area for humans to experience nature and for birds and other animals to live. Areas that are planted with plants are cooler than those that are covered in cement, asphalt, artificial turf, and poured rubber playground surfaces. Somerville's climate change vulnerability assessment says that by 2030, we could have as many as 40 days over 90 degrees and up to 90 days by 2070. It says that, quote, Temperature is a ubiquitous threat throughout the city, end quote, and that, quote, increase in temperature will be exacerbated by the presence of factors that contribute to urban heat island effects, such as lack of tree canopy and limited open space, high percentages of impervious surface, and high levels of emissions from vehicles, among others, end quote. It's pretty clear from this assessment that we need to increase areas that cool. Second, more wild spaces that specifically offer habitat and refuge to the species that were here before us, focusing on pollinators like birds, butterflies, moths, and bats. Without these species, our entire ecosystem, including food production, will crumble. We need to provide a place for these vital species to survive and thrive so they can do their important work. Creating connectivity and pockets of wild spaces will ensure habitat and food availability for wildlife. These wild spaces will need native plants to restore the ecosystem and be undisturbed areas that are not raked or manicured or landscaped in the traditional ways we think of. These spaces are vital to the future health of the planet and we would like to see them given priority. With open space and such limited supply, we think these areas are best created in the in-between spaces, the wooded area below the Corbett McKenna playground on Prospect Hill or along railroad tracks, for example. While it's easy to say that a few hundred square feet of wooded area will not save the world, we would argue that we must do our part. Every little bit counts, and we can lead the region to a new way of thinking about green space and our responsibility to the planet. Three, more grass athletic field space. Somerville has many strong field sports programs, and we do not have the capacity to accommodate them all. This lack of adequate space is causing the community to fight over scraps, and green space and community goodwill are losing out. The city is considering covering many of our grass fields with artificial turf because it is a quick solution, but it's also the wrong one. It offers more playing time, but it has so many negative attributes. It is extremely hot. It migrates particles into the surrounding landscapes, storm drains, waterways, and gardens. It removes green space that we so desperately need more of, and it is very expensive. So we need to make the acquisition of new, healthy, well-maintained grass fields a priority. This will help take the pressure off of our existing fields and accommodate the needs of our residents to recreate. In closing, we must be creative to get the green space we need, deserve, and ask you to prioritize. Climate change mitigating natural spaces, wild spaces, and grass playing fields. We need to look to roofs for gardens and playing fields. We need to think about organisms other than just humans when we think about our land use. We have to put our money where our mouth is for mitigating the effects of climate change. We acknowledge it is happening, but now we need to actively work to bring our environment back to health so we can not just survive, but thrive in the decades to come. Thank you. Of your three priorities, um, 
Can you explain to me the difference between one and two, more natural space and more wild spaces? In many ways, to me, those are the same thing. Yeah, they definitely can be the same thing. I think in a, in a city that has such demand for any space that we have, um, the difference between one and two is that one would be more for, like the, like the Cambridge wetlands where humans can go in there and hang out and animals are there and when it floods it can handle the, the flooding. Um, and then, which could also be a native area. But I think these specific wild spaces would be really focused on, on the health of pollinators. Um, and people, I don't think, would be um, prevented from going in there, but it would not be encouraged. It wouldn't be an easy access. It would be the wooded area below this playground I mentioned, where if you happen to go in there, you can, but it's not an open access. It's not ADA accessible. It's not any place that is known to the public. So it would definitely be more focused on anim you know, non-human animals than, than human recreation. I know that would have been a lovely space for, for our wild spaces idea. I know. I know. I know. I know. Yes. Green space is definitely low man on the totem pole. Low person, low person. Thank you. follow up on this very particular point about um, the possibility of wild spaces along those rail lines. Um, I happen to be in a butter to said rail line and my issue, I'm just going to put this out there because I'm curious with your thoughts on how we could be creative about this, that we actually have, um, we will be losing some old growth canopy trees as a result of the green line extension coming through. And I say this only because I've been really kind of spinning and thinking about, is there a way for the city perhaps to do some negotiation? And I, I'm just kind of throwing this out there and I'm curious if you all have thought about that as that green line happens. Is that part of your thinking? I mean, I'm a, I'm a homeowner, but frankly, I'd rather give part of my land to the city to create wild space than like, ha I don't know. Like I'm in all these conversations about what's happening with the last 10 feet of my, my property. Uh, and I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm just kind of curious, is that something you all have thought about? And is there something that you think that the CPA could be useful? If, if, since you brought it up as a specific yeah. example, I'm curious what your thinking is. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, one thing we've definitely talked about would be having some sort of land trust okay. where the city could, would have funds available. So if a, if a lot came up gotcha. for sale or, you know, if you were made an offer for the 10 feet of your property or whatever, that there'd be some money to buy that would then become public property and could be turned into these spaces. Oh, yeah, no, no, I was just curious what your thinking was yeah. on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think CPA funds would be a, a lovely, you know, to contribute to that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, next we have Luisa Oliveira from Parks and, Parks and Open Space. Thank you uh, for having me. As Dick mentioned, I am Luisa Oliveira, and I'm um, one of the uh, parks planners in the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. And I'm talking a little bit about an update on the state of open space in the city. As you know, we don't have very much of it. Uh, we are the densest community in New England, and we have about 158 acres uh, much of what I'm saying, by the way, can be found in this lovely document, the Open Space Plan, which is all online and is very chock full of dot data. Uh, I encourage you to look at it because it is the, the guiding document for uh, 2016 to 2023 on open space. Um, it, and it, as I started to explain, we have 158 acres, which has gone down a little bit from our last open space, not because we actually lost acreage, but because the data, ha the um, way to measure the open space has become more accurate. Um, so of that, the city owns 57 acres, and um, that's about 37%, and 12% is owned in private 
um, ownership and then 51% of it is owned by the state. And those are the large parcels uh, like Foss Park or uh, land along the Mystic that belong to the state. Um, 158 acres in total in comparison to what Summer Vision sets out for a goal of 125. Uh, it is our, our goal is, and considering we own 57, our goal is uh, quite ambitious. Um, presently, the cost for creating, for acquiring uh, one acre of open space is $2 million, and for design and construction of an acre of open space is another $2 million. So we're talking about $4 million per acre for um, new acres. The problem is not even the money, but that these spaces don't really exist because of our density. So we're really at a position where uh, our open spaces are very, very much loved, they're very contentious, and they're very well used. Um, if you look at the open space plan, section eight and nine detail the goals of uh, what the city is setting out to do in the next years. And they echo much of what we talked about today. The number one goal, of course, is acquisition. And we haven't made great strides on this, as Melissa mentioned, uh, but it's simply because, one, those parcels don't come up uh, to acquire, and, uh, they, and two, they don't exist. Uh, we would love to create four more ball fields, whatever the covering of them is. Uh, you know, regardless of that, we, we don't have a 1.3 acre site that comes up uh, frequently. The second condition, because our spaces are so used, are to look at the, condition, the um, spaces that are in poor condition and renovate them. And coming to the top of that priority is some of our schoolyards because of the fact that they both serve the community, the population in the school, children, and because when they're not used as schoolyards, they become an open space for the community around it. And then the third uh, priority really is to continue to support recreation and health. And that, uh, again, as we mentioned, is important in terms of the fields conversation that we're having in our community because there is a, a very much a crisis, uh, not enough hours to let our um, young and uh, not only youth athletes but other athletes recreate. Um, so I encourage you to please um, have a look at the open space at the open space and recreation plan because it has a lot of the data that uh, allow us to have a kind of a, another level conversation about open space and uh, I thank you for recognizing the challenges that we have um, and for supporting our open space projects. Any questions? Oh, I have a whole minute. and Emily about the development of the new spaces, the 17.5% um, that we aspire to in some of the transformational districts. You were just talking about the difficulty of acquiring new parcels and the cost of acquiring new parcels. How do you square that with the idea that a lot of the new open space in the city will be generated by private development um, versus what we're funding for the acquisition of new space through here? Uh, I think that uh, generating space through private development is one of our uh, biggest tools for uh, acquiring new open space, but I also think as a public space advocate that we have to be uh, very careful and intelligent about the quality of those public spaces. And I have been uh, working with the zoning planner, Dan Bartman, on uh, there, there's a whole uh, breadth of knowledge about POPs because this idea, privately owned public spaces, has been around for a long time. There are a lot of studies in New York City of how do they read as public landscapes? Uh, do you feel like you have to go and buy a meal or a cup of coffee because it's in this area that feels like development. So I think our, the next step in that is trying to really come up with guidelines and guiding the development so that we assure that we have the types of quality spaces and that they read as public spaces. And you know, this is a trend. We are, we are trending to privatize a lot of public amenities. So I think that it's something that we have to be very careful about in Somerville in general. Public 
publicly accessible, you know, a, a privately owned open space across the street at MaxPack, which is public space, but nobody uses it that way. Um, so I, I appreciate your answer that way. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Louisa. All right, that concludes our, our prepared testimony. We are now um, opening up to public testimony. We have three people who have signed up. First is Wig Zamor. And you two have five Oh, wow. It's probably more than I need, but maybe I'll get going. Um, hi, everybody. I kind of came spur of the moment. Um, and I, I really want to address the open space. Um, I agree with all the comprehensive plan goals. Um, certainly we need affordable housing. Um, uh, we definitely need jobs. We're doing well with transportation and, and active transportation and clean transit with the Green Line coming, but the open space is the thing that worries me the most. Um, so I want to talk about some of those summer vision numbers. So. We set a goal of uh, 6,000 housing units, 20% uh, affordable. Um, we haven't put a burden on the housing developments that are under six units. I think we would have been better off to have some kind of contribution to affordable housing because we have already reached our 20-year goal of uh, new housing in the neighborhoods, and that's largely because of that lack of contribution on the small developers. Um, it's not that hard to make money with a five-unit residential development in Somerville. Um, and we have done okay with the jobs largely because of partners. I, I happened to ask partners to look at Assembly Square. I was CFO of a software company that made research tools for National Institute of Health, most of the large biotech and pharma companies in the world. Partners uh, was where that software originated before it was commercialized. And I sold that company for quite a profit for them. I didn't get any stock shares, but I did ask them to take a look at Assembly Square. I, I wish they had built out in a street and block grid like the rest of our, our uh, city center areas. But I'm glad we have the employment there and we, we started to have some, some research and science and computer and tech employment in Somerville. Uh, by bulk numbers for the state, um, we are first in, in uh, residential density, we're first in housing density, we're first in multifamily density. Chelsea's pretty close behind us. Uh, nobody else is close. Our comp plan numbers expect us to grow our population by 25%, so uh, we, we will maintain our population density lead. Um, we are last in the state out of 351 cities and towns with regard to open space per thousand residents. Um, if you use hard numbers, we have about 1.5 acres per thousand. If you use generous numbers, we have about two acres per thousand. There is no health, health or design standard I have seen which suggests you have a healthy city if you have less than six acres of open space per thousand residents. And that was what the BSA used when we were doing the master plan for the South Boston waterfront 30 years ago. We used six acres per thousand. Boston has between seven and eight, acre, eight acres per thousand, so they do meet that standard. And that was the goal for future development in Boston. Um, we also are last in the state with regard to our jobs uh, shortage per square mile relative to residents. So we are short uh, jobs housing balance by over 5,000 jobs per square mile, by far the last in the state. Cambridge is first, which shouldn't surprise you. Um, Cambridge has more than 6,000 excess jobs per square mile relative to residents. So our, our affordable housing crisis here has nothing to do with Somerville. It is a terrific place to live. But it is driven by the fact that Boston and Cambridge each have twice the number of jobs per resident of the regional and state averages. They have 800,000 jobs and 800,000 people. They are short housing for at least 800,000 people in, in Cambridge and Boston. And that falls across the border onto Somerville. Um, so I, I just would urge you to try to um, 
urge the city, thank you, we're going to have to reach outside of Somerville to meet this boundary. We don't have the funds. And I'm sorry Melissa isn't here. I think she and Dan have been doing a terrific job writing the zoning. That's going to continue in discussion for the next year or so. Uh, I happen to have been Melissa's master's thesis uh, reader uh, at Tufts, and um, she's a terrific uh, city employee. Um, our large transformative area developments are not going to supply anywhere close to half of the open space we need. So 17.5% 17, 17 of the land areas in those, those areas are, are incredibly short of the, the need for the city. And just to take Union Square now, because that's what we've been focused on lately, um, for we, we have a, our, our housing and jobs goals require seven and a half million square feet of residential, seven and a half million square feet of commercial space for jobs. So 15 million square feet, just take one or two sentences. It's 15 million square feet of new building, 125 acres. It's pretty simple math. You need an acre for every 120,000 square feet of new building. So with, with two to three million square feet, of, house, uh, of new development just in US 2's area, you would need all, uh, all of 19 to 20 acres for open space. That's more land than they have. So if they gave us all their land, they would just barely be supplying the kind of things that we need. That's how short we are, so thank you. It depends. If you use the state's hard numbers, it's closer to one and a half. If we use our numbers, it's closer to two. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next we have Lisa Davidson. Hi, I'm Lisa Davidson. I was not planning on talking tonight, but I was listening to everything and I want to thank you all and I can appreciate the decisions you have to make when it comes to allocating the uh, sources of funds that you have to various places. I love Somerville. I love, I've grown up in Somerville. I am one of the people that had to move from Somerville to buy my own home. Um, Looking at the buildings in Somerville, I love the history of Somerville. It, it really it, is one of those things where I'm driving down the street and I go, oh, look at that building. I love it. But I'm talking tonight because of the affordability in Somerville. I work for the Somerville Homeless Coalition. We benefit from the CPA funds that come through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. With those funds, we're able to lease. They, they give us a lease and differential um, grant which helps us pay for rent that we would have lost, apartments that we would have lost because the apartments uh, became too affordable. The, one of the buildings that we rent is right here on Highland Avenue. That building has changed hands three times in the, in the 10 years we were renting out of that apartment. Without that subsidy, we, have, we would have lost an easy five to eight apartments. I don't know the top on my head. With with the help from the CPA, we are able to um, save those apartments, save those, uh, those residents from becoming homeless again. They, the CPA, probably about $415 a month from CPA funds pays for a one bedroom apartment in that building, where before we were able to pay for it just with the funds that we got from the federal government. In the past, we would be able to pay for those apartments just with the HUD money that we received. Without the CPA money, we would have lost those units and not be able to secure other housing for those Somerville residents because the rents are too high in Somerville. They also give us funds to help us pay for rental assistance. So, so a people who are already living in apartments whose rents have gone up, people that are living in those inclusionary housing where they've lost their incomes and their rents are not being um, lowered because they can't afford it, that's not what inclusional housing is, would have lost their housing without the rental assistance programs that we get from the sum of uh, affordable housing trust fund through the CPA funds. So I want to thank you all for dedicating as much as you do to the, the housing. I would wish that you continue to distribute the same as you have in the past. Um, 
so housing is not going to get easier. The gen gentleman that was just up saying that people are coming into Somerville. Yes, that's only going to increase supply and demand. If landlords can get the rent that they're asking for, they're going to get the rents. And that means long-time Somerville home residents, like myself, will have to move out of the city, and then we would lose what I love about Somerville, and I still work in Somerville because I don't want to leave. <laughs> so that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, our last person is Tori Antonio. Hi, I'm Tori Antonino. I'm with Green and Open Somerville, and thank you for letting me speak. Um, I got some numbers from the website that didn't seem to be the same of the ones you showed, so I'm sorry if these are not accurate, but this is what's on the website. So to date, we have, um, from the CPA, we have $12,051,532. Uh, so, and in that, um, so far, 51% has gone to affordable housing, 28% has gone to historic, and 21% has gone to open space. And, and this just does not seem right to me. I would like to see an equal distribution of these funds. And um, I know that affordable housing gets top billing, but I want to say that the affordable ho housing, um, th they have the SCC, they have the Somerville Housing Authority, they have the Affordable Housing Trust, and they have 20% inclusionary. And of course, all of these I support. Um, and soon they will get the real estate transfer fee, which is a 1%, it's, I think right now it estimated to six to $9 million that will be going towards um, affordable housing. And again, I support that 100%. Um, but I really think right now we need funds to purchase more land. And you are going to be the CPA and the CPC we are going to be asking you to provide some of these funds. Um, we desperately need them. Um, people make up a city and the diversity of people make up a city, but we need a quality of life that will come with our open spaces and our green spaces and our recreational spaces that we just don't have right now. And I think at the same time in asking for more money from you, I think we can be more creative in how we spend that money and how we develop our, our open spaces. For instance, there's a group called the Community Outreach Group, which is a design nonprofit design company. So it might spend, take $2 million to redesign a space if we you know, uh, go out to contract and have a professional person design it. But if we reach out to a nonprofit group and have the design be part that's, that's a community design that is, um, could be for free, that would be a way that we could better spend the funds that we get. So again, investing in new spaces is what we really like to focus on. And, and other ways that we can get creative in how we design our spaces are our community, get having the community do the installation that, um, and a process of a park that was funded by CPA funds, the Morse Kelly Butterfly Garden. Um, we start work on that next week and it's going to be done by citizens and it's a small, uh, it'll be the Butterfly Pocket Park and um, I hope that that will be an example of how $13,000 will be spent in, um, to very economically fund a space. So um, as Renee spoke eloquently, we need our green spaces for our health. We want to see money invested in recreating our, our ecosystems. The reason we're in a climate crisis is because we've re destroyed our ecosystems. And that goes to how we plant. We've planted with uh, non-native plants, and you might not realize this, but non-native plants do not support our local pollinators. We are in pollinator decline and pollinator collapse. So to restore our ecosystems, um, we need to plant native plants. And again, we need funding. And th but this can be done cheaply. We could, don't have to plant big plants or big trees. We can plant whips and plugs. And um, we're having, having a native plant sale at the Growing Center on the 13th. I hope you all come. So again, I, I would like more funds allocated to open space and recreational um, land. But as well, I will step up to the plate and I will find more creative ways that are more economical in how we spend that money. I also, um, I think we need 17.5% is not enough in the zoning. We'll be advocating for 30% at the very least in transformative development uh, areas because uh, more needs to come from private development. And um, yes, yeah, so 
I hope to continue to work with the city um, to get creative about how we spend money. But again, we ask you to please ded dedicate a higher percentage to the open space and recreational land. Thank you, guys. Well, I have a, um, a land, a neighbor's plot that I'll be working on this summer, um, and it's a two, it's two lots. I guess it's undevelopable right now. She has to um, redraw the lot lines, and I've been looking at that space, and, but I was told that since it's so close to Prospect Hill Park, that the city would not necessarily be interested in it, and I understand because we want to have, you know, a better distribution and have open spaces that are, you know, where people need them more. But yeah, I have a plot of land. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's a two two plots. It would make a perfect pocket park. Again, I'll be uh, using that space this year to propagate plants, and hopefully have a whole bunch to give to the city in the fall. Um, so yeah, I have a few, a f have my eye on a few spaces. I also think we need to use. Um, you know, as soon as it's, as soon as we figure out what what land is going to be taken away from the green line, we need to use our corridors as a way to reestablish our ecosystem. So I, I I want I think that's going to be a key way that's going to help the pollinators come back. So when we do plant our native species in our parks and in our streets, and encourage homeowners to use their land to to start restoring the ecosystem again, which is going to cool the city and is going to help with um, mitigating flooding and and you know this so that's so I was thinking um, along the bike path along the train tracks any sort of you know median strip that, that goes down Broadway right now it's grass why aren't we planting yarrow why aren't we planting landsleep coreopsis these are all like herbaceous plants that are like you know one feet tall and so instead of spending money to like mow that area again it like 10, 12 times a summer, why aren't we just putting, you know, planting it with yarrow, which is great for um, painted ladies. They love it. That's their host plant. And a very, and it's, it stays green during the winter. It's this lovely fluffy plant. And it's like, oh, I, I, I see every median strip I see, every, every uh, sidewalk strip I see, I'm, I just like, I do some guerrilla gardening, and I'm, I'm learning to, to work with the city to be better at um, when I claim a space. Um, but again, th those, those spaces can be used, and vertical spaces can be used as well, along fences, along sound barriers. Um, when developers come in and build new buildings, they, we can have um, vegetative walls. So again, we can get really creative, and, and we need to have a plan, uh, and if there's any members of the planning board that happen to, happen to be here, um, as we start granting permits for people in Boynton Yards, we really need a plan for our green space in Boynton Yards, and I know we need commercial, but that has to be like top priority on our list, because we don't right now, and it's like, if that gets developed sort of piecemeal, then it's like, oh my gosh, what an opportunity that, that we have, that's, that's land that we can you know, use for our civic spaces. So, um, yeah, I will continue to keep my eye out for land. And, and um, again, I just, I'm so passionate about this and I think we can, like, work together and do a really great job at, at, at getting creative, at using the limited space we have. But again, we also need uh, money to purchase land as it comes online. Thanks. All right, if there's anyone else who'd like to offer any testimony. All right, seeing none, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming tonight. It has been very informative. Um, we will be working on, are we starting, when are we starting the next round of funding? Okay, do you want to repeat that again for everyone here so they heard you? So um, if you are interested in applying for, if you have an idea for a community project on city land or would like some feasibility study support, um, the deadline for those applications are May 16th. And then, um, I don't have it, he, I can tell you exactly, just one second. 
Eligibility forms, um, which is the first step of the application process, are due on July 18th, and the full applications will be due September 25th if your project is determined to be eligible. Um, so be on the lookout if you're interested in applying for CPA funding for more information about that. If you're not already signed up for CPA News, make sure you've signed in and check your box so I can add you so you'll get the updates on those dates and when the application forms are available. And um, just in addition to that, um, in addition to the open space and historic preservation opportunities, there's also RFP for the affordable housing CPA funds right now. Um, so if you're interested or you know either um, affordable housing developers or uh, housing program providers, uh, those are posted online as well on the city website. Uh, the deadline for those applications is May 23rd. All right, well, thank you very much. This brings to close the formal part of our meeting. Um, I know, I was about to. In order to formally adjourn this meeting, we need a motion to adjourn. Do we have a, all in favor? All right, thank you all very much.